Hey my dear friends, it's AKRX here and uh, today I decided to actually do a long requested video on uh, addressing this uh, short video done by Cretaceous Cast. Now, um, uh, this is uh, the one about whether or not, again, the T-Rex have feathers or not. So uh, I know it's a very sensitive subject to some people and uh, although it shouldn't really be, it's just all down to simple looking at facts. But let's try that and see where actually this video went wrong. Now, before I um, proceed any further, I want to say that I, uh, if I recall correctly, Cretaceous Cast is actually one of my subscribers. So this video does not intend to harm him or uh, belittle him or undermine him as a person or somebody who is also passionate about dinosaurs. So from the get-go, before I start my discussion and address the problems with the arguments that were made in this video, I want to say that we are in this together and we share a common purpose and that is the desire for knowledge about dinosaurs and uh, the passion and the love that we all have for them. Now, without being um, uh, specified and with the grounds established, uh, I think it is now safe to proceed and address all the points that have arised. Now, um, at, uh, first of all, before you obviously uh, look at it, I would advise to watch the video first and um, uh, I will uh, not be using any of the direct, uh, you know, uh, video material. I just want to simply put the minutes and uh, just address them as, uh, you know, uh, by point and point. So that's why I recommend to watch the video first and then come back and continue with this one. Now, um, assuming that you have already done that, so at uh, 0.44, so that's 44 seconds of the video, I will be obviously paraphrasing here a little bit sometimes, so um, I will do my best to make sure that I accurately represent what was being said. But uh, what was being said was um, finding out how important ancestral traits are, I started to realize it is very likely that Tyrannosaurus had feathers. Now, um, there is, uh, technically speaking, um, uh, it's a common, it's a common um, understanding at the moment that uh, indeed the common ancestors of uh, all archosaurs were indeed either, well, filamented, not necessarily feathered, but definitely a predecessor to what we know as feathers, and maybe in the form of other type of filaments of sort. Uh, but um, all I can say is that from this point of view alone, yes, it might make sense that all of them should actually have any kind of filament, maybe it could be a feather as well. But we already have evidence uh, with uh, different um, evolutionary paths. Over the millions of years, we have evidence of examples where early ceratopsians and neonaticians are showing a variety of filaments, which are not feathers, by the way, like those of Apsitacosaurus or uh, Tanya Long, or we also have the one like Colinda Dromius, which is, has something completely weird and something unique to its own. So nobody has ever encountered an equivalent like that before in real life. So uh, that is yet to be properly uh, you know, described and addressed in terms of what it really is. Um, and uh, it is currently under revision, as far as I know. In any case, as for the Ipsitacosaurus, there is already a paper, that Meyer et al. 2016, that addresses the um, uh, issue with the bristles on the tail, which are not homologous to feathers, by the way. You can read the paper in for more details. And uh, the thing to understand here is that we see these uh, traits being present still, in this uh, group of earlier period animals, but in a later period, ceratopsians like Triceratops, uh, Pachyrhinosaurus, uh, Chasmosaurus, etc., where the skins uh, were discovered, we do not see any evidence of such things being present at all. We only see um, scaly skin, and uh, it's rather extensive coverage. So that is all that has been uh, found. That's one of the examples that we know. Then we also know that Hadrosaurids have also stepped away from this path. They also exhibit uh, scaly skin, and in fact we have mummies of Hadrosaurids. And we also have armored dinosaurs like Ancalosaurids, which also have scaly skin, because we have uh, a good preservation of the Borealopelta, and there are other preservations as well that show that uh, Ancalosaurids were indeed scaly, just as well as we have Stegosaurs as well that show scaly skin. There's quite a number of them uh, that are indeed uh, scaly skin. As a matter of fact, we are uh, currently one of my friends, Joshua Volsey, who was mentioned in this video. I will address that later on. 
he uh, is also currently preparing uh, data collection for the uh, Stegosaur uh, skin. So we will have to come back to that later on on the channel. Uh, but until then, um, all I can say is the, the point to illustrate here is that this is also consistent with the later Tyrannosaurs to also uh, show scaly skin because they are uh, found only with the scaly skin. They are not found with anything that hints on filaments. So the change and reversal to certain conditions uh, or stepping away back to ancestral condition from back and forth is uh, quite a normal occurrence. And uh, the paper like Barrett 2015 Evolutionary of Epidermal Structures in Dinosaurs it d describes quite well this uh, sort of process and it concludes that the uh, integument development does not necessarily always occur from the more simple to the more complex one. Sometimes they revert back to the simple condition and that is perfectly normal as a process of natural selection. Why that happens, we do not always know. We, it's just okay sometimes to simply accept the fact that we cannot answer some of these questions. We just don't have the data to really explain it. All we know is what the empirical evidence tells us and that's the most important part. So with that in mind, we have to simply look at facts, accept the fact that natural selection never sleeps and that uh, unless evidence tells us otherwise, we simply have to take what we have. And with that in mind, we can proceed to the next point. Now at uh, 0, uh, 058, at the 58th second, there is a quote saying all of these were rather small. Now um, uh, that's where also the uh, chart of Joshua Volsey, by the way, that's how you pronounce his uh, surname, in case you haven't already seen my video with his interview. Uh, and um, uh, basically, well, when you say all of these were rather small, could you define what small actually means? What is small compared to what? You have to be specific when you are doing something like this. You cannot just say they were small. Some of, uh, you know, Trade Explainer, as example, has been uh, defining them small and no bigger than a postcard, but we do have evidence of certain impressions that were actually bigger than that. And uh, there is actually a number of them that are bigger. You just have to really do the maths. But uh, in any case, when you're make, using these kind of definitions, you have to be specific. You have to provide the context because without the context, it practically contributes nothing. Now, um, the diagram also has been updated and uh, the link in the description is included, is uploaded through DeviantArt, although I personally am not in favor of DeviantArt as a platform, but we just had no other quick uh, solution at the time being. So please take it for what it is. And it's just uh, basically a very, very quick and easier access for you to take a good look at it. Alternatively, you can actually see the diagram in my interview with Joshua Volsey. I will include the link in the description for those who haven't watched it yet. Uh, that we bring up that diagram as well. Um, now, the other thing as well that I wanted to uh, say that to the point about uh, being made that if because they all have different areas, so the relatives having scales in this area does not imply that Tyrannosaurus rex has them. Well, you see, this is the thing. Uh, all the taxa that uh, have been used in this example, they would imply the, the close phylogenetic relationship because they are each other's closest relatives. So therefore, it is perfectly defensible to, in this instance, to fill in the miss missing gaps via extant phylogenetic bracketing. So this means that you have um, uh, all the conditions uh, needed to be able to generate a defensible hypothesis to say that uh, it is perfectly safe for now to uh, fill in these missing gaps like so. And uh, of course, until further evidence with fossils will either prove or disprove this notion. But until then, the null hypothesis is very consistent. And that is what it is, that all Tyrannosaurids of the later periods, so far, according to the factual empirical evidence, are scaly. Now, at the one minute uh, and 43 seconds, roughly, there was another point that quotes, in fact, not all of these are true scales. Some of the impressions are reticular. Well, uh, th this is where I have a problem because this is actually an extraordinary claim and it needs data and factual empirical evidence and fossil record to support it. You cannot simply say something and expect it to be so. Because saying so just doesn't make it so. It just doesn't work like that. This may be your opinion, 
or maybe someone else's opinion, it could even be a professional's opinion, but unless this very professional in the field has any uh, empirical evidence to support the claim, uh, we cannot uh, accept it, and the science cannot accept it, because it just doesn't work like that. So we just have to really be um, uh, humble here and accept the fact that we cannot make these kind of claims just because it fits the narrative. That is not how it works. Now, um, one other thing as well that you have to understand, all of you here who are watching this video right now, is that if you intend to dispute an already established null hypothesis, you have to go through exact same steps and fulfill the same requirements as those that were done to generate the null hypothesis in the first place. Uh, null hypothesis is currently very consistent, so in order for you to be able to uh, disprove it, you have to have evidence that directly challenges it on equal grounds, which unfortunately we do not have. Or whether unfortunately or fortunately, that depends on your stance. But for me personally, it doesn't matter. I just want to see what the empirical evidence actually says. Now, uh, bear in mind as well, as I know now, that um, uh, you, you don't actually have to have a PhD degree to be able to produce a paper and publish it. However, what we will find problematic is that you would have to go through the same amount of work and the same level as any PhD people, basically, uh, that would be, uh, you know, producing this kind of work to have it peer-reviewed, to have the assessments done, to have the testing done, and all of the relevant steps in order to arrive to certain conclusions. So, regardless of whether you have a PhD or not, you can still produce a scientific paper, but the requirement and rules of the steps and the methods to produce the results are all the same for everyone. Just so you guys understand that. Now, at about two minutes in roughly in this video, uh, there is another quote saying it's likely that these dinosaurs were dead before the integument got preserved. So chunks of the feathers, if I understood and heard correctly from the speaking, because I may have missed that word there, but uh, that basically the feathers could simply just got shed off before it got preserved. Now, uh, this is once again, it's a personal opinion and a speculation, and it's also an extraordinary claim. You have no facts supporting this, and it does not contribute to the case, therefore. So, once again, reiterating the point saying so does not make it so. You have to have the evidence to prove that was the case. You cannot simply speculate and accept people to accept this as a fact. You have to actually argue facts and bring facts to the table if you want to uh, be considered, uh, you know, if you want your point to be considered and to have the same grounds as what the factual already established evidence tells you. So, this is basically very similar to the previous point and it has a, a very similar nature. You cannot simply say something and expect it to be made, so you have to actually have the right tools and go through the right steps to arrive to this uh, conclusion. Now, at 2.07, uh, roughly, the, there is a quote saying, this article argues that the loss of feathers had to go uh, with, ha sorry, had to do with the heat regulation. Now, uh, the thing is, I actually don't, I actually agree with um, uh, Cretaceous cast here. I am not in favor of the idea that climate and heat regulation are the main uh, contributing factors to this uh, occurrence. There are actually instances of scaly dinosaurs, like uh, living in Antarctica, like Antarctopelta, which belongs to the armored dinosaurs, and we only know that there are scales present in armored dinosaurs. So there we go, that's one example. And uh, just as well, we have feathered dinosaurs living in hotter climates. We have Therizinosaurus and Dinochirus, which belong to the Maniraptora, which so far has been consistent to be uh, filamented animals. And they are very big animals, among the largest theropods, by the way. And uh, they are... Uh, Therizinosaurids have actually been found with uh, either feathers or some, so, some type of filament. And they probably lived in a hotter climate as well, because it's Mongolia. I will not be able to vouch for that 100%, but I do think that there is a very strong possibility of climate changing throughout millions of years, and that had no effect on presence, or in any case development and evolution of integument in uh, uh, the dinosaur clades. It's a completely different independent process, and uh, it has no proof of relationship with the climate, and we simply have to look at the fossil evidence as it is, and base our, our conclusions just from the data collection from that alone. We, we cannot simply use this as a factor, because 
uh, there's just quite a number of problems with it that just don't particularly, uh, you know, they can be argued on equal grounds, and uh, I don't think that arguing for climate is a good point. So, uh, in any case, whichever way it goes. So, I am personally very empirical in my approach, and I would simply say, just stick with the empirical evidence and look at what it tells you, and look at the relative, you know, irrelevant paperwork that has already showed you uh, certain, uh, you know, examples of how certain conditions change over the time of evolution and natural selection. That is all I can say about that. So, uh, once again, I might have already cited, if I haven't, then it's Barrett uh, 2015, where they talk about the evolution of epidermal structures in dinosaurs, and uh, it does indeed show quite good consistency of how this hypothesis works, that they can go back and forth, they don't have to always go one direction and stick to that direction. Does that make sense? In any case, let's move on to the next point. Now, at 3.07, uh, he says it could have possibly admitted that they had feathers on uh, dorsal areas. Now, th this is not quite um, uh, true. Uh, you see, the, the, the thing is here, uh, the paper simply left room for the margin error, which means it's because they don't have enough data from that region of the body to have any solid conclusion. But what, uh, the, what Cretaceous cast here unfortunately missed and uh, it's a very common misconception and a common mistake that everybody else makes when they try to argue for the presence of feathers or the chance of them being present is that they um, have established that uh, there is approximately 2.6% chance uh, of, the dors of the dorsal filaments occurring, if filaments occurred at all. So that's basically how narrow it is, and that's practically negligible, unless you basically want to grasp at straws. But uh, I presume that if uh, people who, want, who are genuinely here for science, who want to learn the real thing, uh, this is really not the point. Uh, you have to really go with what is the most likely hypothesis, and uh, that is that they were fully scaly until obviously evidence uh, comes up and starts directly conflicting it, but there is no such evidence right now, and it's no point trying to simply make arguments based on these little nitpicks, because they simply do not stand the scrutiny. At 3.29, uh, if we found the feather impression of Arnithomimus, then uh, how come it hasn't been the same case with Albertosaurus? Well, uh, there is a very simple answer to this question, my friend, and that is indeed because Albertosaurus was scaly, that's why it preserved scales. Ornithomimus was a feathered dinosaur, and that's why it preserved feathers. And that's really as simple as that. That's why we're not finding them having the same impressions, because they're just simply different animals, they have different types of entanglements, which evolved differently. So, there is an answer to that question. And, that's, and it's perfectly consistent with the evidence that we have. Now, I have addressed all the point-by-point uh, -point steps of this video. Now, I will do some overall kind of notes and conclusions. Now, of course, you have to also understand that uh, the author of the video, uh, uh, Cretaceous Cast, has cited uh, the paper itself, Bellatal, which is good, but the problem is that um, uh, a lot of the other uh, articles and uh, blog posts and videos like Trade Explainer, they do not qualify to be a reliable source of information to support the case. You have to only cite the peer-reviewed work that's published in scientific literature. If a, if a person is talking on a blog about something and expresses their opinion, whether it's agreement or disagreement, that is just another person's opinion, regardless of their qualification. Unless they have pro properly gone through the same steps as the original material to establish their, the case they're making in their blog post, that blog post is simply a person's opinion, and saying so, like I said already repeatedly here, does not make it so. Please try to really be careful when you are doing this, because there is a, it's important to listen to opinions, but the most important thing in science, and when you study dinosaurs, is to understand how consistent are their opinions with the facts. So make your conclusions based of that. As regards to trade explainer videos that have been uh, given as the examples to, I presume, to be used as sources, I will tell you now that they are full of errors, which I have addressed in my uh, videos personally, and uh, uh, which also have been admitted by 
trade explainer himself, both in the comments under my video response and uh, in his later video post. However, of course, it left me wanting for a bit more because uh, I didn't feel like his uh, uh, correction did actually address all the problems properly, but I am happy that he addressed at least some of them, and that's a good step to start a new uh, beginning. Uh, now, uh, also, it's important to understand not all filaments are feathers. Feathers are filaments, but filaments are not feathers. It's like saying that tigers are cats, but cats are not all cats are tigers. Does that make sense? You cannot basically generalize, generalize them all under the same umbrella term and uh, use it as a general kind of term and expect, you know, if you want to be very precise and uh, make a very good case, you have to really be very specific about what exactly you are referring to because uh, some people mistakenly refer to turkey beards as feathers, but they are not homologous to feathers. They are a completely different type of filament. So be mindful of these things, please, for the future. Uh, I mean, everyone, not just uh, specifically, this is just a general note section here, so just to understand what is what. Now, I once again want to thank, uh, hope that Cretaceous Cast uh, is going to uh, hopefully find this video here helpful for the future if he wants to make more educative videos. If, uh, however, Cretaceous Cast wants to uh, dwell deeper into this discussion here, I am very happy to have uh, you as my guest on the channel and uh, we can have a conversation about it and uh, let our both of our viewers, uh, yours and mine, that is, uh, have a look at it and listen to it and uh, draw the necessary conclusions if you feel like you want to debate or argue with the points I've made. I absolutely am open to a friendly and intellectual conversation, and uh, we can arrange that as well, if you so wish. And uh, all you have to do is just uh, get in touch with me, and uh, we can definitely figure something out. Uh, or if you just want to do anything else, uh, if you just want to discuss uh, uh, dinosaurs in general and uh, want to do something for the channel, for yourself, and together anything, basically, feel free to hit me up. And like I said, uh, for all intents of purposes, this is simply to point out the problems with the arguments being made in the video, but uh, we are in this together and we serve the common purpose. And that is that we want to remind people why dinosaurs are awesome. Thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe and share and leave a like and leave a comment if you like this video and what would you like to see next. Until then, I've been AK Rex and it was my pleasure. And please make sure to check out Cretaceous Cast channel in the link below. Bye bye now.